please take your Bible and look for the book of Hosea, a prophet, Old Testament prophet there. Comes right after Daniel, if you need a little help finding that. The book of Hosea will be in chapter 1, 2, and 3. Also in your Bible, um, excuse me, in the bulletin is the sermon notes. A little insert there. You can pull that out and follow along with the sermon as well as the scripture in your Bible. We continue today with developing healthy relationships. I'm constantly amazed in my own life how many opportunities I have to seek out new relationships and new friends. And yet at the same time, I wonder what happened to all the old ones sometimes. I don't keep up with them like I want to. Thankfully, even on the internet, it's, it's a little bit easier now to keep up with friends I knew from early childhood. Um, I have a picture of my kindergarten four, age four kindergarten class. And there were about 10 or 12 of us in the picture. And by going on the internet and putting that picture out, I have now remembered who all the faces are. <laughs> it's like, I can't remember that far back. Who is this kid? Who is this girl? You know? And uh, some of my friends have helped me to identify all the faces. And so it, it brings back a lot of fond memories. And sometimes I wish I could still relate to some of those people, but we can't always do that. But hopefully, with God's help, we can develop healthier relationships that we have today and that they will last longer. God desires to help us, and he gives to us certain gifts. We call the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. And we're going through these to learn how to use them to cultivate and develop healthier relationships. Our memory verse is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So will you say this passage with me? There's several of them that are missing because we've been through about six so far. So let's say it together. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Awesome. Some of you are working hard on that. We've got just a few more weeks to finish memorizing it. And I remind you that these don't happen just because we want them to. God is working in us to produce these gifts of the Holy Spirit, these fruit. But... We have to work hard at cultivating them and using them, especially in our relationships. And so that's what this sermon series is about. So today we come to part seven, the seventh fruit, cultivating faithfulness for healthy relationships. So each week I've been trying to define what these are. So let's talk about faith or faithfulness for a moment. The word as it's used here in Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit, faithfulness, it's actually the same word translated as faith in Christ. And certainly the Holy Spirit gives to us the ability to place our faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit helps us to believe in something we can't see with our physical eyes, to believe in spiritual things that we read about in the Bible. We read about it, we hear it from the Word of God, and we choose to place faith in that. But applying that to our relationships Faithfulness is the ability to remain loyal to the relationship no matter what the circumstances are. And that's hard to do. That's very hard to do. Another idea is faith is a moral conviction that persuades us to be loyal and persuades us to be true in a relationship. We, we tend to identify faithfulness in relationship to a marriage. That's the kind of the first one that comes to mind. And so today, I have chosen the book of Hosea as a biblical example of faithfulness in marriage. But it certainly applies to all relationships, and you'll see that. And the question I want to ask and answer today, it's there on your notes. How can I be a person of faithfulness? How do we do that? How do we cultivate this spiritual fruit of faithfulness in our relationships so that we're remaining true, so that we're remaining loyal, so that we're sticking to that relationship no matter what the circumstances? In order to do that, Hosea helps us out with a couple of ideas. You may remember this book or you may not remember Hosea at all. Maybe you've never read anything from Hosea. But in the book of Hosea, it is a story of how God used him, Hosea, as a prophet to demonstrate his faithfulness to the nation of Israel. Israel had been unfaithful to God. 
And the Bible calls that spiritual adultery as opposed to physical adultery. However, in this story, it relates to Hosea by God saying, I want you to go marry someone who is an adulterer, who is unfaithful. And by doing that, this story reminds us of how much God loves us and how he's going to be faithful to us no matter what. No matter how many times we sin, no matter how many times we run away, no matter, no matter how unfaithful we are, God is always faithful. So he was demonstrating that to Hosea and to the nation of Israel by telling Hosea to go out and marry someone who is going to be unfaithful. So it's an interesting story. I want to look at three biblical principles that will help us from Hosea's example. Here's number one. How can I be a person of faithfulness? First of all, be willing to start new relationships. Some of you in your past have perhaps been hurt by someone, someone that you love, someone that you cared for, and they hurt you. And therefore, you're afraid now to develop a new relationship. So let's see it, what Hosea did, starting in verse 2, Hosea chapter 1, and I'll read verses 2 and 3. When the Lord began speaking through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go and marry an unfaithful woman and have unfaithful children, because the people in this country have been completely unfaithful to the Lord. So Hosea ran away. No, what did he do? He married Gomer, the daughter of Diblim, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Hosea's son. Now, this is a difficult passage to read and to understand. There's several questions that come to my mind. Why on earth would God tell someone to do that? Why would he tell someone to marry a person who's obviously, knowingly going to be unfaithful? And secondly, why would Hosea do that? <laughs> why would any of us put ourselves through that kind of misery and pain? If we could see into the future knowing what was going to happen, why would we do that? Well, I think verse 2 and 3 answer the question. It says, because the people in this country have been unfaithful. God's plan was to demonstrate how much he loved the nation of Israel, how much he loved his children, even though they'd been unfaithful to him. And Hosea, even though knowing what was going to happen, he was willing to be used by God. And his choice was a willingness to go and start a new relationship knowing that it was going to be painful, knowing that it was going to be hurtful, knowing that it would not end well. He chose to do that. The, this is a demonstration of faith in God and faithfulness to God, a willingness to start a new relationship. There was a young lady in her early 20s, and she had been abused by her dad and it had left a lot of physical scars as well as emotional scars. And because of that, as a young lady in her 20s, she was having a, a difficult time relating to men especially, but also to everyone else. She just was afraid to start a relationship. She was afraid of people because of the abuse she had endured as a child. Finally, a church began to help her. She got some Christian counseling in that church. And she was able then to start relating to people in a new way and start new relationships. And she began to trust men a little more through that process. I'm sure you've heard stories like that. And many of us have perhaps been through something like that. The sad part is that we can allow a few bad relationships to hinder us from starting any new relationships. It's just a constant wall of fear. We don't want to do that. And if we're introverted, it makes it even worse to go out and start new relationships. It may be that we're refusing to even relate to God. Maybe we're afraid of God. Maybe we've been running from him for a long time. If you don't have a relationship with God, then I ask you to start there today. Start that as your new relationship. You can believe in God by believing in his son Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for your sin to save you. So put your faith in him and start a relationship with God. If you have done that, then perhaps you need Jesus to just be strong in you today and heal that fear and heal that pain in your life 
from a previous hurt relationship or hurtful and painful relationship. And Jesus will do that. God demonstrates his faithfulness to us and through us just like he did Hosea. But if we're afraid to go out and be faithful to someone, we're going to hinder that spiritual fruit of faithfulness. You know, it may be that God is calling you right now to go and start a new relationship with a neighbor or someone at your workplace or someone in this church you don't know. He may be asking you to go and do that. I encourage you, go and start that new relationship. If for no other reason, just to be a blessing to that person and show them the Jesus that's in you. This is how we cultivate faithfulness in our relationships. Now look at a second idea, idea from our story. How can I be a person of faithfulness? Number two, talk openly about any hindrances in the relationship. Sometimes we're in a relationship and things go bad. And rather than talk about what's going wrong and talk openly about what's bad, we just shy away from it, don't we? And we just say, well, I'm going to ignore that person. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to be friends with them anymore. I'm using the term here, hindrances, in, in a generic way, because sometimes there's a little minor problem in the relationship, but sometimes there's a major sin in the relationship. And I'm using the word hindrances, hindrances here to cover both extremes as well as everything else in the middle. Talk openly about them. Moving on in our story in the book of Isaiah, the rest of chapter 1 describes that Hosea and Gomer went on to have two more children. We read about one child being born and two more were born. So God had commanded him, go and marry someone who's going to be unfaithful and have unfaithful children. Two blows at once, right, for Hosea. So he did that. And he had those children. But now in chapter 2, God is now warning and talking openly about the unfaithfulness of Israel. He's not hiding their sin. He's talking openly about it. And there's a parallel story here to Hosea talking to his wife as well. Look at verse 2 with me. Chapter 2, verse 2. Plead with your mother. Accuse her because she is no longer my wife. And I am no longer her husband. Tell her to stop acting like a prostitute. To stop behaving like an unfaithful wife. And I'll stop there. It conti God continues over and over to talk openly about this unfaithfulness. To talk openly about the sin of Israel and what they are doing in their unfaithfulness. God doesn't ignore it. He talks about it. He goes on to talk about punishment and as consequences of their sin. But also here in verse 2, we understand God is instructing the children even to speak up. Speak to your parents. Tell them they're being unfaithful, right? Tell them to stop acting this way. Because God still loved Israel, he states in this chapter that he's going to block their path of being unfaithful because he wants them to turn back to him. And we'll see some more of that in just a minute. These words in verse 2 also point to that marriage relationship between Hosea and Gomer. Apparently, as the story goes, after they had been married, Gomer continued to live a life of being a prostitute. She committed adultery. She was unfaithful. So what is Hosea to do? Is he to ignore that? Is he to sweep it under the rug? Is he to divorce her? No, he is to speak to her and talk openly about this sin with her. Yeah, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be punishment. But God did not divorce Israel. And Hosea did not divorce Gomer. God provided a different option here. Talk openly about it. I found an article that gave the names of some songs, the titles of, of some songs, found in a jukebox somewhere in a bar in New York City. You know, they, they didn't want to identify where this bar was. There are lots of bars in New York City, right? Not that I would really know anything about that. Here's the name of some songs. And you've heard this one before. If the phone ain't ringing, I'll know it's you. Here's one that you haven't heard. If you want to keep the beer real cold, put it next to my ex-wife's heart. Here's a third title. 
She's just a name dropper, and now she's dropping mine. <laughs> and this is the funniest one, because I joke about this in our home quite a bit. The fourth title, I don't know whether to shoot myself or go bowling. <laughs> Which would be worse, you know. Now, some of you may like bowling, so... There have been so many songs and so many song lyrics written about broken relationships. Those are just a few funny ones, but you've heard them. Lots of songs about broken relationships. But for some reason, when it comes to sitting down face-to-face -face and talking about the real issues and the real hindrances in the broken relationship, we don't want to do that. We can sing about it, but we're not really going to talk about it. Isn't that interesting how we do that? Think about how many marriages could be saved if only husband and wife would have sat down and talked about the real issues that are going on and openly confess the sin that is going on. What about relationships and friendships outside of marriage? How many could have been saved and restored if, if the friends would just have sat down and talked openly about the hindrances and the sins and the real issues in that relationship? Most of the time... We're ready to call it quits, as I said earlier. As soon as a conflict occurs, we would rather go through the pain of a divorce than the patience of working things out. And that's our human nature. We have convinced ourselves that ending our relationships are the only options. But God does have another option, and that's to be faithful. We're not to ignore the pain. We're not to ignore the sin. We're to talk openly about it with that person. Deal with the hindrance. Repent of any sin and be faithful to the relationship. It does take time. It takes energy. It takes initiative. It takes hard work. But that's how we become a person of faithfulness in a relationship. Now, going back to the story I mentioned a minute ago, if violence and abuse are the reason because of the broken relationship, then certainly you want to get yourself away from that violence and get yourself away from that abuse. But you still need to talk openly about it, perhaps in some type of safe environment with that person, having someone else present, and talk openly about the hindrances that are there. This is how we can be a person of faithfulness. One more idea from Hosea here. How can I be a person of faithfulness? Number three, take initiative to restore that broken relationship. Now, it may be that if, if it's an abusive situation, you really don't want to restore the relationship, but you still can work things out between that person, having someone else there helping the two of you. But what's interesting is that God really wanted to restore the relationship with Israel, and he wanted Hosea to restore the relationship with his wife. So let's look at the scripture. We're in chapter 2 still here, verses 14 and 15. This is what God says. This is his way of kind of blocking her path to unfaithfulness to draw her back. He says, so I am going to attract her. He's talking about Israel. I'm going to attract her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. Then, or there, I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of trouble a door of hope. There she will respond as when she was young, as when she came out of Egypt. So God is explaining to Hosea very clearly his goal. His goal is to restore his broken relationship with Israel. They have been unfaithful. They've gone after other gods. This is what he wants to do. He wants to restore it. He promises them, I love this, take them into the desert to speak tenderly to them, to return them to their vineyards and turn their trouble into what? It says hope, the valley of trouble into hope. So God is demonstrating very clearly his faithfulness to Israel in spite of their unfaithfulness. God knows that his characteristic, if he chooses to be faithful, it's going to win over those that have been unfaithful. Then we move to chapter 3. And this is where he gets personal with Hosea. He tells Hosea to do the same thing he's doing. So there's kind of a parallel story here between God being faithful to Israel and Hosea being faithful to his wife. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. 
Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Now, the sacred raisin cakes is just a symbol here of worshiping other gods and how they did that. So that's his instruction. Now, what does Hosea do? It says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live, <coughs> excuse me, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. Going back to verse 1 here, God says, go and show your love again. It, it implies that Hosea had tried several times to restore the relationship, and perhaps it had failed. And God says, go one more time, Hosea. Go again and show your love to your wife. So what does Hosea do? No, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> no, he does. So he goes, and he mentions here, and even buys her back. So think about the situation. Gomer had been so destructive to her life as a prostitute, having, she married Hosea, had three children, but then she leaves them, she leaves her husband, she leaves her children, and she sells herself back out as a slave almost to someone else. Because Hosea has to go and buy her back. He mentions here 15 shekels of silver. If I understand it right, that price would have been, in that day and time, half of what a normal slave would have cost. That shows how humiliated her life was. She was only worth half of a slave at that time. And he also mentions that he paid a homer and a lethic of barley. My best understanding of that is that the barley was used as an offering prescribed by God for someone who had committed adultery. So that was part of the offering at the temple. Gomer was in such a state of distress and humiliation that her freedom and the cost of her freedom was only half of that of a slave. But what does Hosea do? He's faithful. And he demonstrates his faithfulness to God and his faithfulness to Gomer. You know, most of us would have said, ah, you're getting what you deserve. I hope you're happy. See you later, you know. That's our normal human response to someone who's in that type of distress and humiliation. But Hosea didn't do that. He went to her and bought her back as his wife. And notice there in verse 3, he says, You are to live with me many days. You will not be a prostitute. You will not be intimate with any man. And I'm going to live with you. What is Hosea doing? He's setting forth boundaries in his marriage. There's been lots of books written about boundaries in relationships. And that's what he's doing here. He's setting forth discipline. He's setting forth boundaries. He does that from a heart of love because <clears throat> he loves her so much. And he desires for the relationship to work. And this is his plan for, for it to work. There are many of you and many people around the world who have a talent for restoration. For example, some people have a talent of restoring old pictures. And I found this one that you see on the slide. It's amazing to me what somebody can do with a photograph and make it look brand new, isn't it? There are some of you and some people around the world that can restore houses or automobiles. Some people like restoring old boats or planes. Some of you and others can restore old furniture or household appliances. Some people I've known can restore old band instruments or orchestra instruments. Our sanctuary right now is getting what? Restored. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We can do that with our sanctuary. When I was a young boy, my mom and dad found an old pump organ. You know, before there was electricity, they had pump organs, and you push your feet up and down, up and down, and you pump air into the organ, and it plays, and you could move the keys or bang the keys around. Mom and dad found an old one, and our pastor of worship at that time knew how to restore pump organs. That was his side trade, and he was very good at it. So he restored that organ. It's still in my house, my dad's house today, and as far as I know, it still plays. I don't know if my dad ever played it. He only knew one song, uh, Shine on Harvest Moon, but he could really play that song. He loved to play that on the organ and even the piano. 
No matter what the restoration project is, it takes a lot of time and effort and energy. And many of you know that. You've restored things before. You've seen it done. Our tendency, though, is when a relationship is broken to say, nah, I'm not going to do that. We run to things to restore them, like photographs or furniture or a church building, but we run away from relationships that need restoration. Sometimes we don't care about being faithful anymore. We've just been hurt too much. And we allow too much time to pass by, and that becomes an excuse. Well, they won't talk to me now. I might as well leave it broken. Is that the way God treats us? Not at all. And that's what the book of Hosea is about. How many times have we turned away from God and sinned against him, and yet he's still there waiting for us, wanting to restore the relationship? God, in his faithfulness, takes initiative to do that. And he tells Hosea to do that. His example is to be an example through us to other people. So is there a broken relationship in your life right now that you need to take care of, that you need to restore? Is there someone you need to reach out to even today and say, hey, let's get some coffee this week. Let's go and have lunch together. I want to talk and restore that broken relationship. I'll say it in the words of God. Go to your friend again one more time and restore the relationship. My invitation to you from this story here in Hosea is this. Will you cultivate God's faithfulness for your relationships? We've looked at some ideas of how to do that in the book of Hosea. And even though this passage that we've read is about a marriage, it applies to all relationships and it applies to God's relationship with us as well. The application is that God calls us to be faithful no matter what the circumstances are. And he puts within us his spirit to produce the fruit of faithfulness. God calls us to a higher standard of life and he gives to us the resource to do it, the fruit of faithfulness. Some of you have heard the name Henry Blackaby before. He's a former pastor and written some good books and Bible studies called Ex uh, Experiencing God. He tells a story, I believe, in Experiencing God of a lady in his church who left the church and decided to become a Mormon. And she wrote the church a letter and said, you can remove my membership from the church. I don't want to be a member there anymore. I'm now a member of the Mormon church. Well, the, the secretary wrote her a letter back. The congregation has refused to drop your membership. <laughs> they prayed for her. They reached out to her. They loved her. And over a period of time, she renounced Mormonism and came back to her home church. That's faithfulness, isn't it? Refusing to let someone go. God calls us to be faithful. Faithful in our relationships and faithful to him as well. So my question to you today is, will you cultivate God's faithfulness in your relationships? And maybe, as I mentioned a minute ago, the one you need to work on today is being faithful to God. Maybe that's where you need to start. I need to be faithful to you, God. And if you want to become a Christian, you know you're not. Do that today. Ask Jesus to come into your life and begin that relationship with God. And then he's going to help you to be faithful in other relationships. So let's pray about it. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your loving kindness and your faithfulness to us. Thank you for demonstrating that through Hosea and his willingness to do what he did. We thank you for his example. Forgive us, Father, for being unfaithful to you and to others. Forgive us for walking away from relationships when we know there's a better way to handle it. Forgive us for giving up. And today, Lord, we choose to be faithful. We choose to work hard at our faithfulness in our relationships. Give us courage and give us boldness. Give us time and energy and ideas to be faithful to others. And for those, Lord, in this room right now who need to place their faith in you, or maybe they've been unfaithful to you, I pray you would help them to take a step today back to you 
or to you for the first time in their life. I pray they would invite Jesus into their life and begin a new relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.